Hello, I am Tia Mugabe. I am your host for this edition of Here We Are. Here We Are is a program created to showcase African culture. We will present Africans as scholars, writers, filmmakers, actors, politicians, and more. Yes, Africans have whores, pimps, hustlers, and charlatans, but so do Europeans. In fact, Europe had so many misfits that they shipped them off to unknown places like the Americas and Australia, just to name two. Here on Here We Are, we are going to share with you some of those things about our culture that others are unwilling to or afraid to show you. So sit, stick around for what we feel will be a very exciting program. And now let us introduce to you our guest. Dr. Conrad World is a scholar and a syndicated columnist who appears in many newspapers across this country. Among them, The Final Call and Chicago Citizen Weekend. He is also a professor of history at the Center of Inner City Studies and national chairman of the National Black United Front. We also have with us today another professor. He is Professor J. Fred McDonald. Professor McDonald has written a couple of books, one of which we will discuss here. He is a professor of history at Northeastern University here in Chicago. Professor McDonald's book that we are going to discuss is Blacks and White TV. The book was published in 1983, and he has just finished updating it for later release in the months ahead. Welcome, gentlemen, to our guests. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to direct my first question to you, Dr. McDonald. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, with all the other subjects you could have written on, why would you choose this subject, Blacks and White? TV. I mean, you would agree that it was a sensitive subject to write about. I think it's a very important subject. I think part of the reason is um, I went to college in the 60s, and very much on the concern of every college student in the 60s was uh, black studies. That's when black studies were discovered. That's when interest in uh, the African-American contribution to American history was uh, brought out and, and, and finally begun to be integrated into the history books. So I am a, a product of my time in that sense. And of course, nowadays, uh, uh, black topics of research are, are, are certainly a, a strong part of any uh, graduate student's training. But back in the 60s, it was a new and exciting area. And naturally, it became one uh, in, w in which I was uh, greatly interested. And when it came time to write, uh, I had so much material on the African-American participation in television that uh, it started out as a chapter and became a book. Mm. Um. In your book, you agree that there is a um, statistically distorted view of different aspects of Afro-American um, lives. How is it that a medium that, um, that, a, that shows a small representation of our culture can affect, in a negative way, large masses, not only um, African-Americans, but European as well. Well, I think, you know, <clears throat> it's, uh, there's, two, there's two different things you're talking about here. The one is your, your culture, or Af African inspired culture uh, because African American culture is neither African nor is it white European it's a distinct product of the black people in this country um, that influence is powerful I mean it may, there may not be black faces on the screen but black influence runs through everything from from in our culture from our music whether it's you know uh, it's Eddie Fisher or Perry Como singing a, a song with a rhythm to it and an upbeat I mean, obviously, it came out of uh, African American uh, musical influence. Whether it's uh, sports, uh, dress, uh, language, the African American presence is there. If the physical black person is not, on the other hand, television is a mass medium. First of all, we have racism, which permeates everything. But above all, television is a mass medium intended for large mass audiences. You had in the beginning in the 40s only three national networks that were both all alike, ABC, CBS, and NBC. They were essentially alike. They all programmed the same kind of stuff, and they all meant to try to get as large an audience as possible. In that kind of monopoly situation, there is very little hope that a minority audience, a racial minority, an intellectual minority, a homosexual minority, uh, any kind of minority, is going to receive fair and honorable and consistent treatment. But when you take that that, that bias against minorities and you skew it with a racist quality, you get what was essentially blacks on television from the, from the uh, mid-50s onward, mm -hmm. which has been a very disappointing, until very recently, a very disappointing representation. 
Now, what is your view on that, Dr. Well? Well, I'm not an expert on blacks in, in television, uh, and I, too, am a product of the 60s. I was talking to Professor McDonald before the show, and we have a lot in common in terms of era. Uh, however, it was uh, through the medium of television. It's interesting in his book uh, that I perused to some extent, he talks about the three phases of blacks mm -hmm. in television, the early phase, which started off of, with with just acute racism, I believe. And then there was a period in the 60s, the civil rights movement and, and the black movement where some adjustments are made. And then he talked about the third phase uh, in which uh, there reaped in conservatism. And so I think on the one hand, I guess it's the dialectics of television because the civil rights movement by showing black people and other people in the American society white men beating black youth and sicking dogs on black youth and rubber hoses in the South certainly helped our movement in terms of mobilizing black people and others who were concerned about equal justice in America. As a matter of fact, it helped so much, the, the Vietnam War period, it helped so much that, the, in my judgment, there was a policy shift in the 1970s, so nowadays they don't show uh, all of what they show during that era when black people are mobilizing and organizing to show the injustices of the system. So television is an interesting phenomenon. I'm reminded of a book uh, written by Donald Bogle, Toms, Coons, Mulattoes, Mammies, and Bucks. And uh, Professor McDonald said that in his introduction that, that the television the production and entry of television in the United States had sort of an ambivalent relationship with blacks. I kind of take exception to that, although I kind of understand what he's saying, because really, yes, it's racism, but it's something a little deeper than that. And that is something we call white supremacy. And so, in a certain sense, television mirrored the motion picture industry, but in a much more sophisticated manner. Uh, and uh, I think that that's, that's where we are. Television is a very powerful medium, and one of the problems that African-American people have is that we don't own significantly our share of the, of the, of the airways of television. When Nelson Mandela was released from, from jail, for example, I understand there were over 100 satellite television satellites uh, in Soweto, when he ended up in Soweto, not one was owned by an African American. So the interpretation of the news, the interpretation of world events, pretty much is still left up to this white supremacy model with a spin on it from time to time, the truth slips through. Mm -hmm. You have to admit, though, that there is a change. I mean, you have um, black-owned television stations, you do have some black-owned radio stations, so the trend it is changing. Do you feel that? No, I, I don't feel it's changing at all. I, I do. I I think what we have is is Professor McDonald's mentioned the Black Studies period in which San Francisco State University and the great strike of the students at San Francisco State led to the first African American uh, Black Studies program in 1967. Uh, a tremendous period of student organizing led by the African-American students and other students who joined in with that movement. Now that story hasn't been told, but what has happened in the history of, of, of television as I see it is they just added more blacks. Very, very seldom do you have a real serious programming. Eyes on the Prize got on. You have the Tony Brown's Journal. From time to time there are serious roles that blacks play in television production. Uh, now blacks are even in the soap operas and uh, so I think what we've had more than just change is adding more blacks into the industry uh, in terms of the workforce. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's been substantive change in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well what's, what's really happened and since I wrote the book and why it cries out for uh, an updating is that that monopoly that I mentioned is gone. It's broken. Cable has given us a plethora of channels. I mean, we're on a channel that didn't exist. And this whole concept of uh, community access television never, ever existed until the advent of cable. The whole idea now is that there's are, there are so many stations competing for that single audience that it's, uh, it's, it's a natural to put on a minority program. Now, that 12% of the population that's black 
which was ignored essentially before, now 12% looks pretty good when you have 100, 200, 300 stations mm -hmm. competing for the audience. There were predictions in broadcasting a few months ago that uh, by the end of the century we'll have 500 channels to choose from at any one time. When you have that much choice, then the, then the network monopoly is destroyed and they're pulling 20% of the audience, but the other 80% is scattered everywhere. And then you can have, instead of broadcasting for the broad audience, you can have narrow casting, specifically focused on this particular group. Intellectuals, you want it, we've got arts and entertainment. If you were, you're a buff on the news, we'll give you CNN, we'll give you C-SPAN, one and two. You're black, we'll give you black entertainment television. And Black entertainment television has become, I think, uh, uh, is maturing tremendously in the last few years. It's now into original program production, uh, lots of interesting discussions, and uh, lots of interesting new productions. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the future is bright, for not because racism has changed, but because, uh, because the there's so much more choice mm -hmm. and opportunity. Now it's time for, as, as you mentioned, now it's time for the black investors to get out there and buy a TV station, mm -hmm. or three, or ten. Now is the time to go out and, and fund programming and start your own programming because there's opportunity to put it on now. And if you can pull 12% of the audience, uh, sponsors will look very nicely on you. Mm. I, think I think we're talking about two different things. I think that what Professor McDonald just uh, expressed is certainly mm -hmm. true, breaking of the monopoly mm -hmm. of, of, of the major television monopoly in America through cable. I guess where my concern is is the <coughs> substance of the programming. I guess one would call it, since we were both sort of <coughs> historians of sort, is the historiography of what is going on. That is, the study of how history is really written that ends up in television production, in plays, in, in various kinds mm -hmm. of movies, and various kinds of talk show formats, in news programming. There's a kind of interpretation <coughs> of the world. We just saw it, e even with CNN being uh, uh, in the Persian Gulf we still got sort of this white supremacy viewpoint of, the, of this last war. And it was very skillfully done, in my opinion, with a military that's almost 40% African-American male, 30% Hispanic, and the rest poor white boys. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was the blacks who said, hell no, we won't go in, 19, in the 1960s. And it was the white students who took up the cry and moved to mobilize the anti-war movement in America. These kinds of interpretations of world events just really don't happen on television. And so I'm concerned, yes, about the breakthrough of the monopoly and giving African Americans and others a greater opportunity. But I'm more concerned about what it is we're talking about. What is the substance of the discussion? What is the content of the play? Mm -hmm. What is the content of the movie because I think we've reached new heights now and our understanding of the contributions of African people to the world. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about advertising. Then. Um, in your book, you mentioned in the early stages of television that um, uh, whites would not uh, showcase blacks in their advertising because they felt it would be a backlash. Sure. Now, um, now, with the presence of more black people in commercials, what is your opinion about that now? Well, they recognize, again, uh, in, in certain products, they mm -hmm. recognize that the African-American consumer is part of an, an, an enormous market. If you took just Africa-America as, as an entity, it would be something like the 12th, most, 12th richest country in the world. Mm -hmm. There are more, black American, more blacks in America than there are Canadians in Canada. Mm -hmm. The GNP of black America is greater than most of the countries uh, we send our foreign aid to. Uh, in fact, it would probably be the, I think, uh, did it once about the third or the fourth richest country in Africa, if it were an African country. Only South Africa and Egypt and uh, maybe one other are, are, are better off in terms of the amount of money that is generated by black Americans. So they're a major consumer force. And now with the breakup of the network stranglehold, where, again, you're not trying to get the a common denominator programming, something that'll please the, the professor and the baker, the black man and the white man, the bigot and the liberal. Uh, now we can find more and more, um, uh, uh, I think, healthy representations. Uh, it's been pointed out, and I think rightfully so, that the McDonald's Corporation is probably the model for the way the future should be. Their use of, uh, of black characters and black advertising agencies, I think, is, is quite uh, admirable. And the, uh, mm -hmm. the use of black slang and, and, and other things is uh, obviously aimed at trying to bring uh, African Americans into by uh, McLean's or whatever else they call them. Mm 
Okay, now what do you feel about the appear, appearance well, I, of the appeal? Well, I certainly, uh, once again, Professor McDonald yeah. indicated, and this is a well-known fact, uh, the $290 billion <coughs> annual income of the African-American community in the United States. So it, there's no question that if we had the proper orientation collectively as a people and pooled our resources, that we could have greater influence mm -hmm. over this medium called television, mm -hmm. broadcasting, newspapers. There are only 300 African-American-owned newspapers in this country. Uh, so that's not very many when you pit that up against the, 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 the white-owned newspapers mm -hmm. in America. So advertising is at the base of commercial television. Uh, in terms of what the age that we're in now, which is the information age, but I wanted to go back to my point that that the 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 major media, including CNN, put forward a position that there were only a few blacks in the Persian Gulf, but and so the shots they they did show blacks and they did show even some black women, but they tended to show more whites in their. Uh, interviewing and shots mm -hmm. of the troops in the Persian Gulf. And so uh, we're in a very interesting period now of subtle psychological warfare in terms of, of where the United States finds itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world with the United States, uh, with Europe going into its European economic community in 1992, the 500th year celebration of the so-called discovery of the Western world with Christopher Columbus, mm -hmm. and we know, you know, how do you discover something when somebody else is already present. So I'm looking, I, I, I'm looking at different kind of programming, the whole debate now mm -hmm. on the question of, of civilization and the origin of civilization. Certainly, obviously, Professor McDonald has pointed out some very interesting mm -hmm. tidbits in, in what happened with blacks in early television. He was telling me before we went on the show some of the tidbits about when Sammy Davis first appeared mm -hmm. on television uh, uh, through the Dave Cantor show. So certainly there, there have been some contributions that African Americans have, have made uh, uh, through to the American society, but I think we're at a new stage now. And the new stage is called ownership on the one hand, advertising dollars yeah. to support it on the other, but then, most importantly, what is the content of what it is that we're talking about because we're still searching for the truth. Let, one, I'll add to that. Now, I, I, the point that he's talking about is a very good one, and that's about the content. I remember when this book first came out, I was on a television show in uh, Philadelphia, and I gave the speech and everything, talked about it. And then afterwards, I had uh, dinner with the host and um, her friend who was a, a, a Muslim. And he s didn't think it was any great advantage for black people to be integrated into the kind of um, immoral culture that is being spewed on television. So now a black actor has the chance to jump from bed to bed in a soap opera. Uh, mm -hmm. This to him was no great achievement. So when you start talking about the quality rather than the quantity, the quality of the programming. I think one area in which um, African-American culture is really setting a standard and, and a tremendously influential one is in rap music. Rap music is television. I mean, it, it couldn't exist without TV. It's the video that makes it go. And rap music is not white music. And the messages coming from that, the cultural uh, critique of white America that's coming through rap music, I think is powerful. I think it's attractive. It's the, the Yo MTV Raps is the number one show on MTV. And that's a very uh, inner city, very rap and very heavily political program. So I think there are some indications of, of, of change within the content of programming that would uh, satisfy some of the you know, legitimate criticisms. And I think, you know, African-American society has always, or at least for a very long time, except the style. They've been stylists in, in our white culture. Uh, whether it's slang, whether it's the you know, vibrancy of dress, uh, whether it's uh, personal demeanor, whatever it is, black uh, America has really been a very stylish uh, model for, for white culture. And I think, you know, rap music may be just the beginning of a, of a uh, I can't say, well, renaissance or I say a flowering even, of African-American culture, which is now possible because of the narrow cast, because of the wide diversity of channels, rather than those big three that strangled black mm -hmm. America and turned everything into white bread. Mm -hmm. I wanted to um, go back from it. You raised a point a minute ago, and I think it's something we may need to elaborate on. Um, the f 
the issue of blacks pooling their resources. It's not a recent issue at all, Alma. Well, this is my position. I don't think there's any more that African Americans can do with a basketball. I think we have absolutely mastered the game that was created by a white man named James Naismith in 1893 in Springfield, Massachusetts. I think the stage of history where we should push ourselves in this search for the truth is to realize four to five thousand years ago on the Nile Valley, African people were doing some tremendous things that had influence on the whole world. Mm -hmm. There's a book out now, Civilization and Barbarism, by one of our great professors, Sheikh Antadia from Senegal, that absolutely concludes once and for all that the ancient Nile Valley civilization was black. And black people had a great deal to do with the development of architecture, medicine, uh, astronomy, astrology, mm -hmm. etc. So the things that African people created in the genesis of these ideas that were brought into the world. African, many African people, African American people in this country, and particularly young people, don't know anything about it. So they don't, so we're mm -hmm. scared of math. And we're scared of, of the sciences. And we, there's a stereotype that we don't do well in those fields. So what is put on television now is Michael Jordan. And, 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 and basketball and football and so forth. And I, I don't have a problem with that. But I think there's an over preponderance of this in terms of what it is that an African-American can actually succeed to become in America. And it's a little misleading. So uh, again, it comes back to my point on content. Mm -hmm. What I was speaking of was basically uh, coming from a monetarily point of view as yes. far as pooling our resources. Um, you mentioned in the book that even back as, uh, as early as the 1940s, you spoke about how um, African Americans were talking about pooling their resources in order to build mm -hmm. Uh, radio station, television, you mm -hmm. know, things to help out, you know, their community. And um, what, uh, where I was coming from was that um, a lot of people in our generation, as you said, do not know that, you know, because um, they don't splash it across. And it's not TVs. only just to help out our community, it's mm -hmm. to make money. I mean, these are capitalists. These guys are not putting their money out there as humanitarians. Mm -hmm. They're out there to make money. But you can make money serving the black community with distinction, with respect, and producing uh, programming, whatever it is, music, theater, whatever, that, uh, that, that pays uh, homage to the intelligence and to the, uh, to the responsibility of the people that you are serving. So, I mean, it isn't, shouldn't be seen just simply as a, as a humanitarian gesture. It really is a way, it's a legitimate and a very, I think, profitable way to make money, serving the black community with quality programming. Mm -hmm. uh, but back to the rap. Um, I would agree, and I think most people would agree, that rap, uh, African American led rap, is having a tremendous <laughs> influence on America, and that the content and substance of it is getting to the heartbeat, it's the grassroots Afrocentricity, if you will, African centered in it, mm -hmm. of, the, of the rap is having tremendous influence. But I remember when James Brown said, Say it loud, and I'm black and I'm proud. Mm -hmm. I remember when Nina Simone said, I'm young, gifted, and black in her music. By the time we got to the 1970s and late 1970s with the entry of Superfly in the motion mm -hmm. picture industry, we had sort of a going from a natural to long straight hair. Mm -hmm. So I'm very leery of, of fads, I think, and this is why I'm getting at, I hope that our content and substance can hold this time what appears to be a growing fad with rap music. I mm -hmm. hope it's much more than a fad because we have gone through this before in our history where we gotten caught up and excited about a new phenomenon, a new trend. But then when that trend reaches its apex, then we move into something else. I think we have to have the sustaining power now because I think rap is a tremendous voice in the absence of what is going on in the public schools of America and the creative energy that's coming out of the mind of, of many of these rappers is very powerful. But I think at this point in history, we have to sustain it. It has to be much more than a fad. Mm. Okay. Because James Brown ended up saying something about America was beautiful 15 years. Uh, I can't remember the name of the song, but he went all the way from saying it loud and I'm black and I'm proud. And the, and the impact that this had was during that era, you're probably too young to, to remember this, but I know uh, McDonald can remember it. Black kids all over the United States were going to school every morning saying, say it loud and I'm black and I'm proud. Mm -hmm. And it had tremendous impact. So the black people who were who were just in 1965 still Negroes 
And in, and in 1925, we officially became Negroes, and we had this tremendous battle with each other internally as to whether or not we were black, because if you call someone black before that, they might slap you. So it was a tremendous contribution to James Brown. We went from sort of a psyche of everything black being negative to being black, mm -hmm. and then a re-identification with Africa. So I, once again, that particular period tended to be rather faddish, and I'm hoping that uh, through television, through our ownership, through our investment, as McDonald says, there are enough African Americans of means, in the, in, and African Americans without means, if pooling their resources, that we could get a share of the market to help solve some some of the many serious problems we face as a people, probably more so than anybody else in the society. They're predicting that if the current trend continues, by the time we reach the 21st century, 70% of African American males between the ages of 16 and 26 will either be in the penitentiary, addicted to drugs, uh, alcoholism, and I guess the rest mm -hmm. of them will be trying to play basketball. Mm -hmm. Or dead. Or dead. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a problem with statistics because um, they're very distorting. Um, I feel that the um, depiction by professionals about um, blacks, you know, how many blacks are on drugs, in jail, things of that nature, um, when you compare something like that to another culture, I think that, that would lessen the severity of it on the people that are watching television, if I can, if you understand what I'm saying. Well, I, I think the problems that, 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 that Conrad is mentioning are all stem from poverty. They're not endemic to any racial makeup or any kind of genetic code. They're coming up out of poverty. We're talking about a culture that is being mired in poverty and as a result is not really able to, to flourish as a, and, and, and it's being ripped off because it's such an exciting. African-American culture has always been exciting to, to white America. And white Americans have been robbing it for centuries from the mm -hmm. old minstrel shows of the 1830s, even before that. But they've been taking the music, the dance steps, the rhythm, the comedy, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 everything, taking out of the co except the black person. Mm -hmm. But I think now, at least in television, and in uh, the fact uh, there's, a, there's a much greater opportunity, and the fact that we are becoming increasingly a country of non-white. When you add the Hispanic and the Asian and the African populations together, we're talking 20, 25 percent already of the American population is of color. And you give the birth rate, statistics you don't like, but the birth rates are there nonetheless. They're much higher among people of color than among white people. By, and they'll give this another century and we're talking probably half the population with all the immigration that's coming into America from non-white world also, we're going to have uh, over half the population non-white. And these old racist notions just won't stand up. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't stand up. And the one way to assault them is to go out and open the business, start the business, and do it, and start s serving uh, the clientele. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that audience, that black audience, is desirable. And there's lots of white people who go with the black audience, too, because mm -hmm. they like the style. Uh, that's very desirable. Whatever it is you're selling, you're writing, you're publishing, mm -hmm. you're putting on television, you're recording on records, mm -hmm. it's out there and it needs to be, um, it needs to be served and exploited by mm -hmm. uh, people of, of color. Now, I want to talk about, um, you mentioned about um, being, ex you know, accepting how um, whites were robbing, you know, blacks of the color. Glad he, I'm glad he acknowledged that. <laughs> it's very important. Well, no, because um, this brings up a point. Now, um, speaking <coughs> of TV again, now, a popular uh, television program will be the soap operas, television soap operas, daytime TV. And um, there was a program, um, Generations, where it showcased um, families <coughs> based here in Chicago. You had a mixture of blacks and whites, good plot, good actors. But the series, what, what about two years? Uh, and then it was canceled. Now, for, for you to say that, um, you know, whites are always robbing or raping, or they're always um, referring to us or looking at us to get ideas and things of that nature. Why would something like this happen? Well, it's coming back, you know. They're rerunning it on BET, mm -hmm. starting from episode one. But why BET -T -E as opposed to, um, what was on channel, ABC? It was on NBC. NBC. Why BET as opposed to NBC? Well, NBC, I think, uh, did not do anything to promote it. First of all, they, st they, they stuck it on opposite the most popular soap opera 
The Young and the Restless is the most popular soap opera with black audiences. They put it on in Chicago opposite The Young and the Restless. And then the other half of it is on opposite All My Children, which has a very strong black presence mm -hmm. on that series. So, you know, I mean, it was a suicide schedule mm -hmm. to start with. They didn't do that much to promote it. Uh, it never hooked on, but most shows with white th families are given something like three, four years. This one was given barely two years to catch on, and when it didn't, it was sliced. Uh, but as I said, it's, it's going to be rerun. All 400 and some episodes of it are mm -hmm. going to be rerun on black entertainment television uh, very shortly. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's not dead, and uh, if indeed it generates an interest, uh, you, know, you could even look for the possibilities of like Twin Peaks, bringing it back and, uh, and, re and uh, continuing it on. Mm -hmm. But it was the first gesture. I mean, in, in that regard, it has to be given um, great credit. The first major network soap opera to put a black family in as a, what they call a root family, one mm -hmm. of the ones on whom the entire series is built. Two families, white family and a black family, which were friends, are the root families of this drama. So that they couldn't just waltz in and waltz out. They were integral to the show. Mm -hmm. Just that uh, I think the network did a very poor job of developing it, producing it, uh, not producing it, but of, uh, of promoting it, mm -hmm. even though the people, for the most part, behind it were not blacks. Mm -hmm. Blacks were in front, mm -hmm. and some of the writers, but the producer was a white woman. Mm. That's interesting. Our style, uh, the Professor McDonald speaks to in the African culture, if you will, the African-American culture, our singing, our dancing, uh, our rhythm, um, our way of speech, the creation of the clothing that we wear. Uh, all of this is very Im important and, 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 and it has had impact. But I'm still suggesting that with this style, there has to be hooked with this style substance. Uh, I do think we see a trend now with the, going back to the rappers now where you see it's becoming fashionable once again. You see great numbers of African Americans wearing kenta cloth around their necks, re-identifying with Africa. See, I, I take a little exception to what the professor said, although I understand it in terms of Du Bois, the souls of black folks, and these two souls that, that, that we've had from having to survive and, and make it in America. But uh, we're still Africans. And I, I always make the, uh, uh, the reference, you know, when we go over into Chinatown, we get paid and get some of that good shrimp fried rice from the Chinese. And then you see the, the young Chinese youngsters reading uh, Chinese newspapers in China, the daily paper in the back of the shop while they're taking, you know, your money. And uh, I, 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 I'm reminded that you don't have to, you know, necessarily go back to Africa to be an African. Certainly the Chinese see themselves mm -hmm. as Chinamen Chinese. in America. So I, I think that the, certainly the adaptation of search, certain cultural elements that we had to develop in terms of our survival, but the influences of the de adaptation of those survivals were still at, at the African cultural base. So this is mm -hmm. getting off of television, but in a sense, that type of discussion needs to get on television. Right. Well, so, it's, it's, it's a cultural. What we're talking about is culture. What we're talking about is uh, ancestry and roots. And while style and cultural contributions are important, uh, the most serious uh, deficit is the drop off in black, of black enrollments in universities, the failure of young black men in particular to, to finish high school, the dropout rate is, 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 is awfully discouraging. These are the areas where there has to be a tremendous improvement where you know, we develop uh, the mind and not just the, the dribble. And so what I think in terms of what's happening with television now, particularly in, in news reporting, and news reporting is very, very censored in America. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. And we have the articulation and the enunciation that there was this great victory in the Persian Gulf. I always want to go back to this Persian Gulf question. And uh, of course, uh, your President Bush, uh, <laughs> <laughs> your President Bush enunciated and articulated this whole question of the new world order. Now, what is it? This is this is this permeates throughout all the news that we've been hearing over the last two months, and people have been <coughs> raising the question: What is the new world order? There have been talk shows and forums and intellectual exchanges on the new world order. Well, for for African American programming, I think instinctively, 
we can sort of articulate and put data to what the new world order is because the new world order is an update of the old world order which is really based on white supremacy but they're saying if you want to join us you can so this is why they need the Colin Powell's of the world and others mm -hmm. uh, like that so as long as you join us and you're loyal to us no matter what we're doing in the world you know you you can get along so what happening on television is a little confusion going on and it creates a uh, a kind of, of a, a false analysis of the real events that are going on in the world and the implications for the United States foreign policy. We were talking before we came on the air about the, uh, President Bush's pronouncement of choice, which will, if implemented, will seriously impact on public education in America for African Americans and Hispanics mm -hmm. and, 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 and poor white people in America. This is the only way they've had an opportunity to have access to education. And there's a trend now, and McDonald was telling me before the show, he read some reports that the way it's going, by the time we reach the 21st century, there will not be public education in America. So these particular issues are the content and the substance that African Americans, young African Americans <coughs> like yourself, Ms. Mugabe, have to take up the charge. So we're getting over the hill. He's turned 50, I'm on 50. <laughs> and we, we've got to have young people like yourself who went to Tougaloo uh, College who majored in journalism to take up the charge and take us to the next step. This is the information age. All you have to do is push a button and you can get some information. Mm -hmm. And and we now we've moved away from a, a, a reading society. We're mm. a society that watches television and we watch videos and we go to the movies and we don't read. So now books will have to we'll have to figure a way to have people read books on television mm -hmm. uh, because books are still at the basis of, of all of this and at the basis of, of, of the whole discussion is the question of ideas and we always say ideas are weapons of war and this is this is what is is, is going on right now that we have to penetrate mm -hmm. there are studies that have been done where um, they feel that African Americans more so than European Americans believe in the reality of television though everything you don't see on TV is true they take it more and apply it to real life as opposed to other races. I mean, what, would, what do you feel about that? Well, I, I've never seen those studies. I just think that, you know, people with less education tend to be more gullible. Uh, not necessarily all, and not necessarily all those with education aren't gullible. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I don't necessarily think, I understand why that would be a, a particularly a cultural pattern that African Americans believe what they see on TV. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, shouldn't believe much of what you see on television because what you see on TV is like looking at the world through a straw and mm -hmm. if you think at the, looking at the end of that straw that that's the world mm -hmm. there's a lot more around it that you'll never see yeah there comes into play also the impact that um, television mm -hmm. you know by being a um, small medium as compared to the audience that watches it the impact right you know, that's what you it's have like to you millions of people being asked to look through that same straw right. at the same time right but Probably more so than any other group, I think I read statistics again. You see, it's not so much as you should, Ms. Mugabe, as a young African-American emerging journalist, we should be against statistics. Statistics are very important. It's the interpretation of the statistics. Okay, then you're this, right. this, this becomes very important, but, but the statistics that I have kept up with over time indicate that African-American people, because of the impoverished situation, the mm -hmm. lack of employment, watch television more than any other group of people in America. So this is why the marketing, McDonald's and all of the yeah. corporate uh, entities target the African-American population. And then here are the people uh, who watch television all day long and then go out and buy all the white man stuff to continue to empower the white corporations who buy the time. And so it's a tremendous <coughs> contradiction. It's a tremendous challenge we have to to turn the tide. I think what we have have done from the early period of the development of television in Amer America is what I said earlier. Certainly uh, in Blacks and White in TV, written by McDonald, he chronicles a great deal of this. The, the early uh, participation of African Americans in television right on up in, into the 70s. But I think there needs, there's a great need now for a shift. I do not want to watch BET and just see video all day long. Every now and then they mm -hmm. will insert a town hall meeting 
that are very important. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, I was on one uh, a, a year or two ago on, 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 on blacks and genocide in America, and they had blacks and in, in, in the relationship of Jewish people in America, and they've had some very good town hall meetings. But predominantly, the programming of BET is videos, and we, 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 we're video to death. And so in, in this age, information age, in this age of, of recapturing ideas to try to help our people get out of this tremendous crisis mm -hmm. that we find ourselves in, I think television can be useful if young people like mm -hmm. yourself will take it to another level. Okay. You... We'll help you. <laughs> But he's right. We need mm -hmm. black creativity. We mm -hmm. need all. We need black writers. We need black designers. Mm -hmm. We need black minds to come up with uh, the uh, new program, mm -hmm. new ideas. Develop them. Get out mm -hmm. there and 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 write the script and mm -hmm. produce the thing and find sure. support and try to get it on YouTube. And come to Access Channel. Mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, schedule time to produce your own show for the, mm -hmm. the city to watch, and oh. you can learn by experience. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of people, uh, both black and white in our generation, um, they feel that um, the power is being in front of the TV, <coughs> when that's not necessarily true. Um, just as you mentioned, uh, producing, writing, things of that nature, um, that is, that's where it is. That's where information starts. That's where it starts, and that's where it's controlled. Mm -hmm. You know, I always... Uh, when we have these type of discussions, I'm reminded of Carter Woodson's book, The Miseducation of the Negro, that mm -hmm. he wrote in 1933. And Woodson finished his Ph.D. from Harvard in 1915. And he writes in the book that one of our problems is understanding really what the purpose of education, and it's a real very good critique on the American uh, educational system and its impacts on blacks. But he said this white fellow that he graduated from Harvard with went out to Los Angeles and set up a hot dog stand and became a millionaire. So I think that if you, if you study uh, many of the men and women, both black and white, who have acquired wealth uh, in the world, many of them are untrained people. And we, we can document this with the African American experience. So the point is, I mean, who makes the, the equipment for television mm -hmm. uh, when you say getting behind, getting out from in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. It's a great economic industry that has many components. Uh, in the 1960s in, uh, in, in Chicago, there were two printing presses. The uh, Mohammed Speaks on the Elijah Mohammed had a major printing press over here on 22nd Street, and the Chicago Defender had a printing press. There are no African-American-owned printing presses. In the 1920s, Marcus Garvey's newspaper, Negro World, had a circulation of eight million a week. Now, there's, there's, something, there's, there's something where we have to take what it was we did to survive in the past and update it where we are now in an advanced technological society. And I think that television can play a tremendous role in helping mm -hmm. us do that if we use our creativity and, uh, and move it to a higher level. Mm -hmm. In your book, you um, not only were you talking about blacks and white TV, but one component of it, you talked about um, white northerners and white southerners and the way they view television and how that it was um, different. Now, what do you think of that perception today? Well, I, I'm afraid if you look at the history of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Civil Rights Movement made its greatest strides in the South, battering down lots of the uh, more mm -hmm. traditional old South residuals of the uh, slavery era. Where it really died, the civil rights movement died, is when it came north. When it came to Chicago, I mean, Richard Daley was probably the first major mayor who was able to uh, thwart Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Daley didn't give up anything for Martin Luther King Jr. He didn't win anything here. Uh, the riots of the 1960s were in the north. The north uh, always had a certain kind of attitude uh, that as long as the civil rights movement was uh, taking place in the South, that indeed uh, it, it was all right. But as soon as they came home, they changed. And I think that that kind of attitude was uh, based on the notion that somehow the, in the North, we weren't racists. Uh, we were liberals. As uh, a matter of fact, i take it one step further. We came to the North to get, get away from mm -hmm. the racism of the South because right. the North was supposed to be this place of, of, of great opportunity to work in the steel mills and the meatpacking industry. However, I would say that we have an interpretation problem because even though King didn't win in the way that he won in the South, something did happen. 
and that is by his presence here it was it was sort of a question that was put on the table whose side are you on mm -hmm. and at that particular time in Chicago you know there was the silent six black aldermen and there were the preachers who stood with Daly when Daly told King to get out of town and so forth so it, it put a demarcation mm -hmm. if you will in the African-American leadership which which was always, there was always a resistance now for the empowerment of African Americans in, in the electoral arena. And I think part and parcel, that helped set the stage uh, in a certain way, not directly, to the election of Chicago's first African American mayor. Because many events happened, and, and, and uh, Daly taking the position he did on King really drew the battle lines in the African American community. So in that sense, I think King's presence here helped us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a little historiography. <laughs> um, in your book, you had a uh, brief excerpt on Paul Robeson's television life, and then you also spoke about Nat King Cole's, and there was a comparison made. Now, it's my opinion that there was no comparison between the two gentlemen. I mean, they were, I mean, aside from the fact that they were both African American. And uh, my question <coughs> is, well, how would how does America perceive the um, the aggressive African American on television now like as opposed them. to then? They okay, like so them. they are more accepting of a passive. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. now what would you consider uh, a Bill Cosby? Um, I think Cosby is about as uh, radical as you can get, and still be very very popular with the whites. Their gestures, things he does on the show, guests that he brings on the show. Uh, attitudes that he's that he uh, communicates on the show, and then in his own personal life, I mean, from giving money for the Tawana Brawley Fund uh, to uh, being an outspoken uh, critic of, of, of uh, racist practices, uh, he's much more in person than he is on the program. But even within the program, I think there are those gestures, and there always have been. I mean, he's always been that sort of uh, uh, character that the uh, white audiences embrace. But in, in the meantime, he was sending out uh, about as subtle. Uh, was subtle, but nonetheless about as uh, realistically as you could get these these images. Martin Luther King's picture on the wall uh, in, in his home in, in one of his early series uh, is a good example of, of communicating. Walking around with a record album under your arm, it's a Ray Charles album. It could be any album in the world, but why would it be a black performer song? And these kind of things, uh, I think. Quincy Jones's music to open his show uh, are all part of, of the communication of uh, a black pride. It's part of that, in the, when he began, it was part of that Black is Beautiful movement of the late 60s. And Cosby was very much a part of it. And I think that carries over today. I think uh, the man is a, uh, is a genius in terms of his ability to, uh, to uh, entertain everybody in the audience, white, black, brown, or whatever, but also to uh, <coughs> connote and communicate a sense of uh, ethnic pride, a racial pride. Mm. Now, what do you feel about that? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, I'm an old Joe Lewis fan, <laughs> okay? And, uh, it's a credit to his race. <laughs> he's a credit to his race. Uh, and matter of fact, there were people uh, that we called race men. But, you know, when Harold Washington debated uh, Rich Daly and Jane Vernon, and I think it was in the primary election of 83, Joe, uh, Harold Washington says something in his speech, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> and everybody in the African American community, most people, at least those who were over 35 or 40, knew what that meant because they knew that Joe Lewis said this regarding, I believe it was his, one of his fights when he was coming, going to have to fight Max Mailing for the second time. And I might have my history wrong. But what McDonald is pointing out here is the subtle messages that that uh, uh, Cosby puts out that has to do with racial pride in his programming that may not be seen by anybody else but the careful eye of an African American, these symbols, these images. And so that's why we need to use our creative energy. You know, I'm not the Huxable family and this doctor and so forth. I'm not all that impressed uh, with, with that, although we do have some black families that uh, 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 live like that. Sure. But I think on the other hand, to balance it out on the Cosby programming, I, I, I would tend to agree that some of the subtle messages uh, are, are positive. But we need more of that. And we need, that's why we need to up the ante. I mean, mm -hmm. here's a, a very acceptable show to, to many whites 
uh, and McDonald's just points out that it's the most radical programming. So we do have a problem because yeah. we need a, a programming that's far more radical than, than the Cosby Show. Mm -hmm. And that, that's our challenge. And when I say radical, I'm talking about really getting at the truth in our programming of the experiences of Africa. Who has ever done a, very, a serious program on the contributions of Marcus Garvey? who is perhaps in the white... Tony Brown? Yeah, one show. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Crosby's on all year. That, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, who has done a, a, a real... Other than the Tim, Eyes on the Prize did a fairly good job of capturing the civil rights movement. I mean, the, the pictures there were priceless of King and, and Stokely Carmichael walking down the road and having an ideological argument. I mean, those were just priceless kinds of, of, of filming, but we need more of that because in Harold Cruz's book, The uh, Crisis of the Negro Intellectual, he talks about one of our major problems as a people is we have what we call historical discontinuity. Here it is only a, a few years ago in the 1960s, <coughs> which you were probably born or on the way into the world, I think, and many of our young people don't know anything, have no connection to what happened. It was one of the greatest periods of organizing that took place with African Americans and its impact on the society. You say, you, you say in a speech to some high school students, you mentioned, it. well, SNCC was a, SNCC who? And even still, now, even though the imagery and the spirit of Malcolm X is reemerging, uh, thank goodness, Still, some of the, our young people think Malcolm, when they say Malcolm X, it's Malcolm 10. Who is Malcolm 10? <laughs> so SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating mm -hmm. Committee, SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. So uh, there's a television, I guess what we're, we're saying, at least from my vantage point, mm -hmm. uh, can play a tremendous educational role. But then on the other hand, as McDonald has pointed out earlier, it could be a tremendous economic arm for the African-American community if we use it in that way. Yeah. There's no, ma there's no mystery to this. You get a person like Malcolm X, or as you mentioned, Paul Robeson before, uh, they were right. But the way they said what they said, and uh, as aggressively and as threateningly to the, to the white audience, uh, made them commercially un uh, impossible. Uh, Paul Robeson was supposed to be on Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt's right. program as uh, vice president of the Progressive Party. <clears throat> and uh, he was canceled when all the right-wingers and the, the veterans organizations went crazy in 1950. And in four days, NBC announced, or the uh, Roosevelt people announced, that he was not going to be on the show after all. Because he had come out and said something such as, you know, how you couldn't understand why any black person would ever go fight against communism because, you know, capitalism has been lynching blacks. Capitalism has brought racism and segregation and all these other racial abuses. The communists uh, had never been tested yet, and they had promised this wonderful uh, equality. And therefore, anybody who would go fight against communism, particularly in the in Korean War, uh, certainly uh, didn't understand that he was really fighting for his own oppressor. Jackie Robinson and others, of course, jumped out and said, you know, I'm a God-fearing American, and I'd, I'd go to Korea if they called me. And, uh, all this kind of stuff, but the uh, Robeson's uh, leftist views, which were fine during World War II, when the Soviet Union was an ally of the United States, boy, the government put him on international mm -hmm. radio, his records were big and all this, but he couldn't even get on television on a talk show with a liberal woman like Mrs. Roosevelt in 1950, primarily because the people who run it have got lots of money invested in it, and they're not on there. They're, first of all, they're not on television to educate the American people. They're on television to sell commercial products. Television was new, and they had lots of money, and they're uh, invested in it, and they're not going to risk alienating the majority audience because of this guy's political point of view. Malcolm X for the same reason. They did a, a documentary in 1959 on him, and the Muslims called The Hate That Hate Produced. And it was uh, Mike Wallace with some sort of a, a, a sort of a liberal attitude pointing out, now these guys hate us, but it's because we have hated them. And uh, without clearly understanding uh, uh, Malcolm's point of view. But again, he was too radical to be on television uh, in any kind of uh, discussion format type of situation. So I think that, you know, given the realities of this instrument, it's, except for uh, Henry Hampton's Eyes on the Prize productions, which are on public television, mm -hmm. uh, and even that has political, great political constraints, but nothing compared to the political constraints that are there on the business-run, for-profit networks. 
And in those situations, it was always very difficult in the age of network television to, uh, to bring those people on TV. Now it's mu there's much greater opportunity because of the breakup and because of the narrow casting potential that two, three, four, five hundred stations are going to make uh, mm -hmm. possible. Um, Dr. World, uh, there are reports that um, confirm that African Americans retain the majority of their information, informative information, from television. Now, well, I, I, I you know, I, I would assume that African Americans uh, don't read as much as we should. Mm -hmm. Obviously, and other people in American society uh, don't read as, as much as they should, and this is why they had a tremendous movement, mm -hmm. because when the whites discovered that some of their young people, that they who had come from families who had sent children to Harvard and Yale and Colgate and Rutgers couldn't read too well, then they started this whole movement back to basics. So I would assume in that context, African Americans are dependent for a, a, a large amount for their information from television. And that's unfortunate, uh, given the fact that we don't read uh, as much as we should. And that is why we, it is not so much getting the information of the television, it's the kind of the, the substance and the quality of the, and the interpretation of the information that we, we get. I mean, the, the interpretation of what went on in the, in the Persian Gulf was that the United States and Bush were absolutely justified in what, they're, what, they, what they did and killing up all of Hussein's, uh, the people in, 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 in that region of the world. Well, I'm, I'm certain that I could put on a show that would show that this policy was absolutely backward and reactionary and give a whole other side to that. And so as a result of the UN cry, we now had this whole patriotic movement unfolding and holding up the red, white, and blue of America. Any, anything that America does is right. The United States invasion of Panama is correct. The United States invasion of Grenada, a little tiny black island with only 100,000 people, was correct. Uh, so uh, they're not correct, uh, in my judgment. And, uh, and we can have programming that could point out the contradictions of, of this kind of movement on the part of, of the U.S. They really still haven't really admitted that they were wrong for being in, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that they should in all of what, what went, went on there. So I would say, you know, what happens on 47th Street in Chicago, what happens up on Northeastern at Bryn Mawr and St. Louis, really has a relationship to what's going on nationally mm -hmm. and what's going on internationally in the world. And television plays a tremendous role in that. And I think uh, to probably far more than any other group in the American society, African Americans have, are dependent on television for their information. Mm -hmm. Uh, which, in one hand, it has its great potential, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, it, it has its great uh, deficiencies because some of the information is very misleading. As M McDonald pointed out, it's like just a little tunnel. That's right, you're going through. Um, my last question. You are coming up with an updated version of your book. Um, what will we expect to see? Well, point. the first uh, printing deals primarily with the moral argument. It's, you know, it's wrong, it's racist, they shouldn't do this, etc. That's ultimately the position, which is a legitimate criticism. The next one is, is looking, the update deal looks much more at the technical and the, 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 the structural point to conclude that with the breakup of that network monopoly, it doesn't make any difference anymore if they're racist. They want to make money. You want to make money. They want distinguished programming for that black audience. That 12% now is a big number all of a sudden. It's a major number. When you've got 100 or 200 stations competing, they want uh, black viewers, and you're going to have to give them good programming, or they won't watch it. And in, those, in that regard, then, I think the future is very bright. And what really breaks down racism is contact, interaction between whites and blacks. I'm an integrationist. I believe in it, though it's getting a lot of bum rap these days. But I think being in contact, black people, white people, brown and whatever, mm -hmm. it helps to break down the ignorance that is the basis of mm -hmm. racism. Okay. I want to thank you both for coming to our show. We ask you to come back again. Okay. Thank and thank you. And you keep up the good work, and we'll look for you on your television station in the future. Okay. I hope that um, we here, we only showcase a... Um, we only scratched the surface of this subject, and hopefully if you come back, we'll be able to get into it more. Um, this program here is, encourages you to read a book or two. Um, the book that I would recommend now is The Big C by Langston Hughes. Um, until next time, ladies and gentlemen, this is Tonita Armogabe. Thank you, and God bless.